as a header on your notes. Uh, you may put something like this. The purpose of suffering is what we're going to be examining from the text today. As you know, it's been some time now that we began in Ezra to build a context to understand the sermons of Haggai, to understand the sermons of Zechariah that were given in that day and in those years and in that period of time in which uh, God's people were rebuilding the temple that had been destroyed before they had been given over into Babylonian captivity. And concerning this chapter, concerning these two verses today is will be our focus and really what we see is a continuation as you will see as well what we'll see is this continuation of the thought from chapter 13 now John Gill in his commentary on the 14th chapter of Zechariah described basically gave an overview of the 14th chapter itself and he said this chapter speaks of the coming of Christ with all his saints and his personal appearance among them. This is what we see later in the chapter. And of the signs of the times before that. And of what shall befall the enemies of the church, both open and secret, and of the happy state and the condition of the church itself. Calvin went on to say this, but now he reminds them that their peaceful condition in Judea would not be without many trials and would not be without many troubles. And so, therefore, he exhorts them to patience, lest they should faint in their adversities and that they would repent of their return. We see this throughout the Old Testament, particularly if you go back into the book of Genesis and Exodus when God led the children of Israel out of uh, the Egyptian slavery. Uh, they found themselves before many obstacles that were impossible for them to overcome or to go through themselves, but God made a way. In the Red Sea, God parted the, the waters hither and thither, right. and the Scripture says they walked through on dry ground. Amen. They were thirsty, and God caused water to come from a rock to, be, to give them to satisfy, to quench their thirst. When they were hungry, God provided the church in the wilderness manna to eat. When they were hungry again, God gave them quail to the full. So much that it was coming out their nostrils, so to speak. So as we consider this and as we think about this topic and this idea of suffering, uh, we must also understand and put it kind of in its right place and have a right frame as we understand this. In life, in general, whether then or now, in life, there must of necessity be contrast. Now, the definition of contrast, I'm going to give you a very simple definition this morning, but contrast, by definition, is degrees of difference. So degrees of difference... For example, between the lightest and the darkest parts of the picture. <coughs> Contrast. For example, light and day, or light and darkness, day and night. These are both two completely different parts of the same day. Yet we understand and even accept the fact that we need the night as much as we need the day. Another example of contrast is sunshine and rain. Again, we need the both of them for our health and well-being. If we had only sunshine and no rain, what would happen? Everything would dry up and die. And if we had only rain, everything would oversaturate and die. But we are able to gather the facts around about light and darkness. Mentally, we're able to gather these facts around light and darkness, about sunshine and about rain, and we're able to come to this conclusion that though light and sunshine are preferred, yet without the same degree of importance, the darkness and the rain are, or with the same degree of importance, the darkness and the rain are also absolutely necessary. Amen. With, we need them both. So as we begin our time together today, and as we examine verses 1 and 2, we'll focus on a topic that many uh, in the large 
swath of Christian uh, Christianity, uh, a topic that many love to hate. Few people want to hear of suffering, and even less want to understand it. But it is incomprehending today for us both the reality and the purpose of suffering that we as God's people will grow in grace and in knowledge. I had considered uh, posting on Facebook uh, introducing this sermon, uh, but I thought about all the sermon bloopers that are bullet, church bulletin bloopers that I had read throughout the years. For example, what's the sermon this week? What is hell? Come and hear our pastor preach. I thought about what is suffering? Come and hear the message. But that would not have went over well. So today, I, I, we should be reminded, uh, as uh, one of the old Puritans, John Grinsley, has said this concerning suffering. He said, these temporal infirmities which God's people hear are subject to, and that more than others, their sufferings. Sufferings in their estates, in their good names, in their liberties, by crosses and by losses, by reproaches and by restraints. Here also is the strength of God, Brinsley said. Here is the strength of God perfected in their weaknesses, in supporting and delivering them, in bearing up their spirits under them, and in giving them comfortable issue through them. Suffering is a reality. Amen. But God is our God. Suffering may be a reality, but we do not suffer alone, and we do not suffer purpose, purposelessly. Keep that in mind. Brothers and sisters, today I want to remind you that we must enter into suffering. Now, again, this sounds warped to the world, but we must, as believers, enter into suffering with a song of faith on our hearts and words of praise upon our lips. Amen. This means that we must be ready before those times come, or when those times come, because certainly those times will come. One of the old songs that you might want to have on your lips, Trials dark on every hand, and we cannot understand all the ways that God would lead us to that blessed promised land, but He'll guide us with His eye, and we'll follow till we die. We will understand it better by and by. Right. The second verse of that song says, Oft our cherished plans have failed, disappointments have prevailed, and we've wandered in darkness, heavy-hearted and alone. But we're trusting in the Lord, and according to His word, we will understand it better by and by. Amen. So, humanly speaking, Humanly speaking, church, the downside to suffering is that we seldom, in that moment, comprehend the purpose of said suffering. We seldom realize or understand this. In our pain, whether it be physical pain, physical suffering, whether it be spiritual, emotional suffering, we encounter great sorrow, and none should deny such a fact. It is a reality. Our hearts and our minds at many times and many points in our lives melt within us. And I would ask you this today, honestly, have you known this to be true in your life? If you have a pulse today, if you are living and you are breathing in this place, you would likely have to say, yes, I have experienced this in my life. Or maybe you were saying right now, I am experiencing this in my life. I exhort and encourage you today, trust in the Lord. Amen. Cast your care upon Him, for He cares for you. Amen. So this morning, the exposition of these two verses are quite straightforward. They're quite direct. And the application, the so what preacher, is however a bit more detailed and will require us a bit of time to walk through this morning. So we're going to do two things. First, number one, we'll exposit the text. And number two, we'll proceed with application with the goal of 
gaining an understanding of why suffering takes place, why suffering takes place in the world as well as in our lives, and number two, to understand how God uses suffering to bring about the glory to himself and for the good of his elect people. Straightforward, the expo exposition, as the text says, Behold, the day is coming for the Lord when the spoil taken from you will be divided in your midst. Now, you might be lost if, you, if you're not familiar with the book of Zechariah, but as we have gone through it verse by verse, line by line, here we have coming to the close of this, this, this series of sermons preached by Zechariah to God's people in the days that the temple was being rebuilt. And it is here in this text, remembering particularly where we were last week, or week before last, remembering at the end of chapter 13 that the Lord told Israel, if you want to skim back up to verse 9, uh, 8 and 9 in chapter 13, the Lord told Israel that they would be in great tribulation, so much so that only a remnant would come through it. The Lord then let them know that the remnant that came through would be tested and refined for the sake of purity. And it is here in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 14 that we read the continuation of this same line of thought. And the language used here in the text, church, the language used in the text is very clear. And yet I would have to say it would have been very difficult for them, for Israel at this time, it would have been Israel, difficult for them to get their minds wrapped around what was said. In verse 1, again, the Lord said that they would be spoiled. Or in other words, they would be devastated. Mm -hmm. That they themselves would be just devastated and spoiled and that the very spoils that, that would be taken from them would later be divided amongst them in the sight of their enemies. Mm -hmm. What a hard... It's what a hard saying to understand, what a hard thing it is to comprehend. But it's also significant for us to know what the text says particularly about this day being spoken of. First of all, note what the text says. It, a day is coming for the Lord. This is the ESV. A day is coming for the Lord, meaning this. It's a day that belongs to the Lord. And it's the day that belongs to the Lord for him to do with as he sees fit. Matthew Henry said, The day of the Lord brings with it both judgment and mercy. It brings mercy to God's church and judgment to her enemies and to her persecutors. There is no truer statement that could be made than what Matthew Henry made right there concerning that verse. Now, Concerning verse 2, some may ask this question. Is this day of the Lord speaking about the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D.? As we know for a fact that this took place. Or is this talking about wars coming on the land just 200 years or so after this prophecy is given? And those amongst many other questions are very good questions, but... I think a reasonable answer to all of, to them would be all of the above and then some. Because there was much that God's people encountered in this time, in just the short years after this period, wow. in the long term future, they encountered a great deal of things. And up until the time of Christ, they endured a great many things. And what did Christ say when he came to the disciples? That when you are brought before kings and counselors for my sake during this heavy period and time of trouble and trial, do not be afraid of what you shall say, for I will give you the words that you need in that very hour. Throughout the text of Scripture, we have this, and bear with my wording, this, this promise of suffering for God's people. We are promised suffering. We are promised persecution. But we are not left to do it alone. Amen. And we are not left comfortless in the midst of trouble and persecution. Matthew Henry went on to say what that day is, what that day meant here is uncertain, as I mentioned, and perhaps will be uncertain, as Henry said, the Jews speak till Elias comes. 
whether it referred to the whole period of time from the prophet's day to the day of the Messiah or to some particular events in that time or even to Christ's coming and the setting up of his kingdom on the last day. This is why I said it's likely all of the above. There is so much encompassed in this passage. There is so much encompassed in this text. And it continues to be important that we comprehend the use of the language that is used here in this text. This language plant, paints a picture of both, keep in mind, both present and future realities for God's people. Present and future realities of God's people. The present realities involve God's fulfillment of His promises concerning his own leading, his own feeding, and his own caring for his people, while at the same time, the thrust of his focus is pointing to that day when the Lord himself comes to the world incarnate in the flesh, and then it is like the telescope extends once again, and even further we see that unique day that's spoken of in this same chapter in verse 7, that unique day where I believe the eternal state is referred to. So we have both the present, or they have the, we have the past, we have the present, and we have the future in view here. In the immediate context, the Lord is obviously addressing them where they are now in their current situation and reminding them also that the days farther out will be perilous and that they will certainly have and endure hardships. Zechariah continues in his speech, though, by giving notice in this next verse, by giving graphic details about the destruction that would come upon Jerusalem yet once again. Here again, we see the use of fractions as we saw in the 13th chapter. The use of fractions obviously given as a representative of the fact that not all would come through the calamity. We have two-thirds and thirds mentioned in chapter 13. Here we have half and half mentioned, 50-50. Nevertheless, it, those are representative terms speaking of the remnant that would come through the calamity. Throughout the Old Testament, we see this terminology used of some dying and some surviving. We see this from the time God led the children of Israel out of Egypt. In the wilderness, some lived and some died. Mm -hmm. Through the other excursions that we see take place throughout the Old Testament, some lived and some died. We see this terminology, some exiles and some remaining, as we see here in verse 2. It's important for us to remember that covenantally speaking... The church under the Old Covenant was a mixed multitude. Now, what do we mean by this when we say the mixed multitude? What is meant when we say this is this, that Israel in the Old Testament was full of people who had been circumcised physically to become part of the physical nation of Israel, but not all had the circumcision of the heart, which was the spiritual work of the new birth that only God himself can work in the individual. Very important. The Lord has his church in the Old Testament just as he has his church in the New Testament. And whether it was Old Testament or whether it was New Testament, those that had and had the circumcision of the heart are born again and will forever persevere. Here's the good news about suffering. Here's why our suffering as believers is purposeful. Because we will not ever be finally destroyed. God will keep the people whom he saves. That is good news today to the believer who is downcast in their heart and in their soul. Who can barely lift their head from their chest. Oh, folks would say that's a sad state to be in. I would argue with them tooth and nail. Listen, that is the best place that we can be. Have our heads hung down low. A broken heart and a contract spirit. Recognizing that we have nowhere to look but up. And that is to the living God. Psalm 34, as we move to the application of this text here again, like I said, the, the, the exegesis of that text was so simple and so straightforward, but as we move now 
to the application, the so what, preacher? How are we to understand and how are we to apply this to our lives, to our hearts, and to our minds where we can suffer and glorify God purposefully in our suffering? Psalm 34 said this. We read these words. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. The term delivered there in the text in Psalm 34 refers to being rescued or it re refers to being recovered from. It's a verb that speaks of being rescued through trials and through temptations. Were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, exempted from the fiery furnace? No. They went through the fiery furnace. And who was it that kept them? God. And what kind of expectation did they have before going into the furnace? They, they, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stood before the king and said, We will not bow even if you do throw us into the fiery furnace. We will not bow. But we know this one thing. Even if we go into the fiery furnace, our God will be with us. Amen. And it wasn't just a few minutes later, right, that the king said, Hang on, guys. Did we not, go, did we not lose some folks throwing these men in? And, and did we not just put three men into the furnace? But how is it now that we see a fourth? And the fourth one is like the Son of God. Amen. Purposeful suffering. Amen. So this term delivers, the Lord delivers them from us, from them all, means yeah. that God carries the child, carries the saint of God through the trials and through the tribulations. The Bible nowhere teaches that anyone, anyone, whether lost or saved, are exempt from trials and tribulations. Matter of fact, Paul told Timothy. If you will live godly in Christ Jesus, you will suffer persecution. This is the word of God. So the Bible nowhere teaches that anyone, whether lost or saved, are exempt from trials and tribulations. As Christians, we shall have great trials and we shall have great testings of our faith. And we most certainly will endure hardships. But here's one of the most important things for us to remember as Christian people is that when we suffer, we suffer for we suffer what is referred to as purposeful suffering. So there are essentially two types of suffering in life. Praise the Lord. In the life, let's be very specific here. Two types of suffering in the life of the believer. Yeah. Either as believers we suffer as a means of correction from the hands of the Lord. For you are without chastisement, your bastards and not sons. For God chastens those whom he loves. So there's one type of suffering in the life of the believer. And either we suffer as a means of correction at the hands of the Lord, or, or we suffer providentially from the hand of the Lord in order that we may gain experiences that will benefit both us and our brothers and our sisters down the road. If you turn to 2 Corinthians very briefly here, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, just to bolster uh, this idea of purposeful suffering and how God uses suffering in our lives to not only grow us and enrich us and to make us into His likeness, into His image, to whittle off the rough edges, but it's beneficial for those that we come in contact with down through the, our time in this world. It's beneficial for your brothers and sisters in Christ here in the church to know that you have hurt, that you have suffered, that you have endured the same hardships that they might be going through at the present hour. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that, to the end, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Amen. Such encouraging words there. So suffering, suffering in the life of the believer is a process 
in which we are both sanctified and in which God is glorified. The Apostle Paul spoke of this purposeful suffering in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 10 through 13. Paul said, Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect. Notice the purpose. Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect that they also may obtain salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. He said, this saying is trustworthy. If we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. And if we are faithless, he remains faithful. For he cannot deny himself. This hope and this confidence that the Apostle Paul set forth in this statement to young Timothy was not based in and of himself, but it was based on the character and the nature of Almighty God. That what God said, he will do. If he promises he will perform such a work. When we understand today that our suffering, when we suffer for God's glory, that it is productive and that it produces, according to the Word of God, the peaceable fruit of righteousness in our lives. It is in our understanding of this that we can embrace our sufferings and recognize the fruit that God is producing in us. The good news concerning suffering is this, that as Christian people, we do not suffer as the world suffers. Certainly, all suffering, we must know this, all suffering is a byproduct of sin. According to the Word of God, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, the ground was cursed, the, the curse of sin was pronounced upon all, right? Everything didn't evolve from there. Everything began to devolve from there. And we see suffering is a reality in all the world. Over the rich and the poor. Over the smart and the dumb. Over the tall and the short. Over the wise and the stupid. The curse of sin and suffering is upon the world. However, according to this text, According to the text of the Word of God throughout, the Lord makes sense of suffering, and He causes even the curse of sin to submit itself to the cause of Jesus Christ. Amen. Sin did not thwart the work of God. Amen. Sin did not stop the work of God. But my friend, the work of God in the man Jesus Christ on the cross spoiled principalities and spoiled the powers of wickedness yes. and publicly proclaimed victory over them all. This is why we can thank God for His victory over the kingdom of darkness. This is why today you, as a saint of God, even in the midst of your suffering, can say, God, I thank you that you have translated me out of darkness into your marvelous and glorious light into the kingdom of the living, unshakable God. What's the big picture here? Well, actually, let's say this. If we're to understand suffering, we must, in some way, we are to comprehend the infinite wisdom of God in a small and in a finite fashion. Yeah. And then what we must do, because we are small, we are weak, we are little in our understanding, we are a, 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 a finite in our grasping of the big picture, we must step back and try to see, according to the Word of God, what is the big picture. So what is the big picture? The picture looks like this. God created the heavens and the earth. Being omniscient, meaning knowing all things, God needed no pre-existing material to create, and He needed no one, no one, to aid Him with chemistry, biology, botany, or any of the other sciences. Being omniscient, being omnipotent, all-powerful, 
God did not need the approval of anyone to do as He sees fit. Amen. God created from nothing all things. And there are in those there are those in the sphere of the theological world even today who would argue against this biblical idea and say that God is limited in his working by the attitudes and by the actions of men. I would quote Paul there and say, who do you think you are? Well, maybe that's R.C. Sproul. Maybe, <laughs> maybe Sproul was quoting Paul right there. But who do you think you are? Who art thou, O man, to reply against the potter? Right. There is one who made all things. There is one who guides all things. There is one, according to the word of God, who directs all things according to his divine will. And that is God. And so it comes down to this. Either God, and you must make this decision. I cannot make this decision for you. I cannot bring you to this understanding, but it comes down to this. Either God is absolutely sovereign over his creation, or he is not sovereign at all over his creation. There is no in between. God will not share his glory with another. Our starting place in understanding suffering begins with this knowledge of God. If we do not begin with the knowledge of God, we will find ourselves dazed and confused in this understanding. Is God in control or is man in control? If God can be turned aside, if God essentially can be thwarted from accomplishing His own will, then I would ask this question, why should anyone believe in Him? And why should anyone trust in Him? You say, that's a question that the atheists say. The good thing is, when you know and when you understand who the true and the living God is, having been born again, born from above, my friend, you can with certainly stand with confidence and rest in the true and in the living God alone. It will be Beneficial for you if you understand and if you know and if you recognize that God is sovereign, that God is omnipotent, and that if God is omniscient, then why would you not cast yourself upon Him today? Why do you struggle? The question the Lord asked the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus, why do you kick against the pricks? Why do you fight God? Listen, the reality is that, yes, you can certainly fight God. It's been evidenced throughout the Scriptures. But when God calls you, when God draws you unto Himself, whether you fight or whether you don't fight, you will come eventually. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3-7. through 7. It will be beneficial for us to know that through sufferings, know this, through sufferings, that we are kept by the power of God. Amen. Through suffering, we are kept by the power of God. The Apostle Peter, in writing to the churches, uh, to the saints scattered abroad in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, and all those other regions there, he said this, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope Amen. through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, to an inheritance that is undefiled, to an inheritance that is unfading, to an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you. Who are you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time? Peter said, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that to this end, so that you may be aware, so that the tested genuineness of your faith which, by the way, is more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, so that it may be found to result in 
glory mm -hmm. in praise and in honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. In an article, uh, Piper, in an article entitled, Your Suffering is Not Meaningless, John Piper states this, that not only are we kept by God's power, but that we are kept by God through suffering by sound doctrine. You want to know why it's important to be a sold out, bought in member of a local body of believers? Because under and by and through the preaching and teaching of sound doctrine, your heart will be established. Right. Your confidence will be built up and placed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So that when the hard times come, you'll remember what thus said the word of the living God. Amen. Piper went on to say, he said this, By the ordinary means of grace, by prayer, by preaching, by preaching and teaching of the word, and by the ordinances themselves of communion and baptism, we are kept by the Lord in and through these things. Mm -hmm. Richard Baxter, of the old, one of the old, another of the old Puritans, said this, Read such books as contain the essential principles of religion, and treat of them in the most plain, affectionate, and practical manner, tending to deep impressions, to renovations of the soul and to spiritual experience without which you will want the essential qualifications for your future work. Baxter taught, the, the Puritans taught, we do our best to teach. Do not be satisfied with a shallow, ankle deep, a knowledge of the living God. But go for the deep impression set forth by the Word of God. Know the depths and the understanding of the knowledge and of the love of God. Know that God is bigger than your imagination. Know that God will not be limited to your imagination. Know that God created the heavens and the earth. And that in His creating of the heavens and the earth, that He didn't just set it in motion and leave it spinning, but He guides and He directs in all ways. As Christians, we need to know what the Bible says about who God is. We must know the character and we must know the nature of God first and foremost. For the knowledge of God is the beginning point for us to know and to practice religion rightly. We have this repeated throughout the text of Scripture. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Amen? Amen? That's what the Word of God says. So, theology matters. What the Bible says about God matters. It matters both to the lost and to the saved. Amen. It's not effectual to the lost. It is effectual to those who believe. But nevertheless, it matters. Sound doctrine. Sound doctrine according to the theology book of all theology books, which is the Bible, by the way, mm -hmm. teaches us not only who God is, but also what God expects of us. It is by and through the doctrine set forth in the Scriptures that we as believers are able to comprehend what godly suffering and what worldly suffering is, as well as the purposes that they serve. So on the other hand, the unbiblical teaching, so we, we see the importance of sound doctrine and theology, the unbiblical teaching of the health and the wealth, the prosperity gospel, has led many unsuspecting and even well-meaning Christians down a path of doubt and down a path of deconstruction. And brothers and sisters, it is heartbreaking and it is heart-wrenching to consider that someone would assume that they are saved and yet after having been led astray by sound or by unsound teaching and by unbiblical doctrine that they feel themselves to be lost all over again and they cast away the very grace of God from before them. My friend, that is a sad state of affairs for any person to be in. But the Bible teaches us that the rain falls on the just and on the unjust. So keep in mind, again, a right frame, keep in mind that rain isn't always a bad thing. Rain is beneficial for growth. Rain helps when the temperatures are hot and we need to be cooled down. 
So our view and understanding of suffering and even sorrow should be balanced according to the Bible's teaching on these subjects. In the book of Romans, for example, again, the Apostle Paul states in reference to physical suffering, Romans 8, it's a chapter that many folk probably have set to memory. But in Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 18, the Apostle Paul said this, and the context is, light, is, is in light of suffering and even facing death for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul said, I reckon that the sufferings of these present times are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Amen. There is nothing that we endure here in our living and breathing lives that is going to be able to comprehend or going to be able to change or be able to lessen, but it will simply magnify the glory of God when we come into His presence. For the earnest expectation of the creature, Paul said, waits. And what do we wait for? For the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain even until now. And Paul said, not only they, not only those who suffered previously, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves. What? Waiting for that adoption to wit the redemption of our bodies. Let me make something clear. We should not fall into the trap of escapism where we just want to get away from everything. But we should not also move away from the biblical understanding that one day when Christ comes, we will have a glorified body. Amen. We should very much look forward to that. Amen. He said this, For we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. Right. For what a man sees, why does he hope for it? But if we hope for that that we do not see, then we do with patience wait for it. Mm -hmm. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities. Again, our suffering is not purposeless. Our suffering is purposeful. Right. And we do not suffer alone. But we have one who God has sent the Comforter, the Paraclete, right. to come alongside, to lead, to guide, and to direct us, to comfort us when times are at their darkest, and to say, no, this child of God, though, th though times may be hard, they th though things may seem grim, at this moment, there is a better day Amen. that we have to look for. And this is what the day that was being pointed to by Zechariah to God's people then. Likewise, the Spirit helps our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us. Oh, He pleads for us. He intercedes for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. There may be times where he, or even now where your prayer seems not to go above the ceiling. Listen, but know this, the Spirit intercedes with groanings which cannot be uttered. Don't expect everyone to, everyone to understand what it is you're going through, but understand this, everyone may not know, but God knows. God understands. And God cares for you. Amen. Lastly, today, our suffering, our suffering should be bolstered up. It should be held up. It should be propped up if you would have it, framed up. Mm -hmm. It should be bolstered and held up by God's promises. Husbands and wives make promises to each other. And you know what? Every one of us is guilty on not fulfilling those promises. Mamas and daddies make promises to their children. And guess what? Those promises aren't always kept. Friends make promises to other friends 
Family makes friends, promises to family members, but those promises don't always come to be. But my friend, when God makes a promise, He keeps that promise. You can, as the old saying goes, take that to the bank. You can put that in your pipe and smoke it. <laughs> Suffering should be bolstered up by God's promises. Mm -hmm. God's promise. God promises suffering to His saints. God does promise suffering, but He also promises deliverance right. through these sufferings. Another of the old songs says, When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look to see Him there who made an end to all my sin. Because... The sinless Savior died. My sinful soul is counted free. For God, the just, is satisfied to look on Him, to look on Jesus, and to pardon me. Psalm 34, in closing, as we see from God's Word, from Psalm 34, promises that you can stand on. The psalmist declares in Psalm 34, Beginning in verse 1, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Mm -hmm. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt His name together. Listen to the words of the psalmist. I sought the Lord, and He answered me. And He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to Him, here's a promise, those who look to Him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of through all his troubles. And here's a promise. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. And he delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. For those who fear him have no lack. But young lion suffers want and hunger. The lion... The king of the jungle suffers hunger and want, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Amen. Come, O oh children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Amen. What man is there among you who desires life and who loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil. And your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Mm -hmm. Seek peace. And don't just seek peace. Don't just seek the peace of God. But pursue it. Mm -hmm. That means do it and keep doing it. Right. Don't stop. The eyes of the Lord. Here's a promise. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous. And his ears toward their cry. Mm -hmm. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. To cut off the memory of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears. Mm -hmm. And delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near. Here's a great and a blessed promise. And something I encourage you who are broken hearted here today to be reminded of today, the Lord is near to the broken hearted. The Lord is near to the broken hearted and He saves those who are crushed in their spirit. Oh, you say, preacher, I have no strength within me to reach up unto God. God has reached down to you. And He has promised you that in your lowliest state that He is there. Amen. Many are the afflictions of the righteous.
righteous, mm -hmm. but the Lord delivers them out of them all. Yes. He keeps all his bones. Not one of them is broken, speaking of Christ, by the way. Affliction will slay the wicked, mm -hmm. and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. What a contrast there we see. Afflictions, trouble, and trials will slay the wicked, but the Lord redeems the life of his servants. Right. None of those who take refuge in him, the psalmist declared, will be condemned. Right. Stand with us this morning today.